Welcome to the Texas Heart Institute Educational Series. We're here today to discuss uh, innovative technologies and techniques. We've asked Dr. Uh, Vonmer Crazier to speak to us today. He's the cardiologist at the Texas Heart Institute and clinical professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. He's also the president of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. I'm Dr. James Livesey. I'm a cardiovascular surgeon at the Texas Heart Institute. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's a special pleasure to uh, share with uh, our audience uh, our experience with first percutaneous abdominal aortic aneurysm repair ever performed, which was performed at Texas Heart Institute uh, in uh, June of 1996. Now, the first endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, or EVAR, was performed in Buenos Aires, Argentina, by Dr. Juan Carlos Parodi on September 7, 1990. Dr. Parodi is a vascular surgeon that trained at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, he has seen many complications related to conventional surgical repair of abdominal aortic aneurysm in patients with serious comorbid conditions. So when he performed his first EVAR, his goal and his purpose was to decrease surgical risks of this procedure, to reduce patient's discomfort, to offer the patient earlier discharge and quicker recovery. At the present time, the prevailing trends of endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair in the world are typically hospital admission, the procedure is primarily performed in the operating room, and the cost of the procedure when performed in the operating room is between three to six times higher than, than in the interventional room. The procedure is typically performed still with the use of general anesthesia, which requires the use of central venous lines, use of Foley catheter, a nasogastric tube, radial line, and uh, a pump team possibly for certain cases. Now, uh, femoral artery cut down and surgical femoral artery repair also carries certain complications. In addition to that, the hospital stay typically is at least uh, 48 hours and the recovery room stay typically is 24 hours, which again adds significant cost uh, to this procedure. What makes you decide to change your approach uh, to endo endovascular repair? Well, uh, as I have already mentioned, there are possible complications of EVAR when we use general anesthesia and surgical femoral artery repair such as pain, neuropathy, risk of infection, bleeding, scar, lymphocele, and prolonged recovery. All these measures increase the cost, morbidity, and unnecessary expenditures of healthcare resources. So we envisioned that a minimalist approach of EVAR would be a simpler approach with less risk and offer our patients faster recovery with less complications. So what is percutaneous femoral artery access and repair? It's the use of local anesthesia, conscious sedation, and percutaneous access to the femoral artery and also repair without surgery. When we were designing this procedure, we had in mind what, Dr. what Albert Einstein mentioned many years ago, and he stated clearly that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Now, another well-known uh, individual in a totally different field, a German architect that eventually performed uh, and stayed and lived in the United States for a long time, Mais uh, Weinderow stated that less is more. So when we start thinking about any field, whether it's vascular, cardiovascular medicine, or even architecture, we have to try to simplify the procedure and in this way, make it more 
applicable to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Crazier. What was needed to achieve this goal? How did you uh, approach uh, EVAR? Well, in 1996, when we started designing this percutaneous approach under local anesthesia, we had many obstacles to overcome. One was the devices were still very primitive. The original devices were very bulky. They required the use of large bore sheets, as we can see here, 22 French sheet. And they were routinely performed with the use of general anesthesia. Performing the procedure in the operating room with surgical femoral artery access and surgical femoral artery repair. So at that time, to make the procedure simpler, make the procedure suitable for percutaneous approach on the local anesthesia in cardiac cath lab, we had to design our own device and reduce the profile of the system or sheath that we use for this particular procedure. We used commercially available devices that were approved for vascular use, as you can see here. We used a PTFE material that we sutured on this particular stent, and then we constrained this uh, device in a, a sheath that was no larger than 14 French. And uh, we were then able to deploy the device through a significantly smaller sheath that was suitable for percutaneous access and percutaneous repair. Here you can see uh, in comparison 22 French sheath being used at that time for femoral artery access is with surgical techniques versus on the right hand side 14 French sheath that we used for the first PVAR which was performed on June 4th 1996 at Texas Heart Institute. And here we can see this first patient's angiogram prior to um, performing the exclusion of this aneurysm with our technique. Now, Dr. Denton Cooley was present at this procedure and uh, the first patient that we had that underwent this procedure was Dr. Cooley's patient. This patient had a lot of comorbid conditions and had all the contraindications to conventional surgical repair of his abdominal aortic aneurysm. Dr. Cooley's motto was modify, simplify, and apply. Very similar to Albert Einstein's saying, make it as simple as possible, but not simpler, or out of chaos, find simplicity. So we have to be thankful to Dr. Cooley for his vision, for his optimism and support in being able to perform this procedure percutaneously under local anesthesia in cardiac cath lab in 1996. Here we can see the final result after Stengraft deployment. Again, this patient was discharged the following day and there were no complications of the procedure. Well, that's, uh, that's quite a frontier that you crossed there with that first case. What has your experience uh, been with PVARs since that uh, technique was developed? So uh, this particular uh, patient uh, had a successful uh, repair of his abdominal aortic aneurysm and as I mentioned, was discharged the following day. This was reported in Texas Heart Institute Journal, and you can see an artistic rendering of the technique that we used uh, for this uh, particular patient. Now, it's important to mention that in 1996, we did not have a, what we have at the present time. We did not have a closure devices for femoral artery access and repair. So we had to use mechanical compression and here we, you can see one of them, which is FEMSTOP, to uh, control uh, the bleeding and achieve uh, hemostasis. Uh, our first experience was reported in the Journal of Endovascular Therapy in 1997. And you can see one of the patients that underwent this procedure on the left-hand side. We can see 
very large infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. And on the right hand side, we can see the angiogram after this aneurysm was successfully excluded with a stent graft. We have performed uh, 54 procedures using this technique within a year in high risk patients with significant comorbid conditions that were not candidates for surgical femoral artery repair. And you can see there on the left hand side, the upper panel, the uh, 14 French sheath being advanced into the femoral artery. We had ad had excellent results, no conversion to surgery and no procedural mortality with this technique among first 54 patients that were performed with this technique. There were three patients that had a pseudo aneurysm or bleeding from the access site that were repaired with endovascular technique or manual compression. So none of the patients required surgical repair and there were no life-threatening complications with this procedure. Well, that's really uh, impressive early results. What has your uh, experience been the last 20 years and uh, has the procedure changed in any way? Several years ago, we celebrated a 20th anniversary, anniversary of PVAR. And here is one of the publications related to that and questions that were asked uh, by one of the um, editors. We selected PVAR for patients that were at high risk for surgery and had either absolute or relative contraindication to surgery and general anesthesia. Our results were excellent and uh, we have reported our experiences on several occasions. But what's important to um, know is that since 1997, we had suture-mediated closure devices available for femoral artery access and repair. So we have changed our approach. We didn't have to create our own stent graft that was low profile, and with newer suture-mediated closure devices, we were able to close the access sites all the way up to 26 French uh, with, with a success. So in the last 20 years, significant progress has been made as far as the closure of the femoral artery is concerned with suture immediate or other uh, large bore closure devices, which we use now routinely uh, on all our patients, not just for EVAR, but for any kind of procedure that requires the use of large bore sheets, such as uh, percutaneous aortic uh, uh, valve repair, uh, thoracic aneurysm repair, and many other interventional procedures. And our success at the present time with the use of those large bore suture immediate closure devices is in the range of 97%. Wonderful results, uh, Dr. Grazier. And, and I can say as a surgeon that I've, I've witnessed the uh, uh, excellent uh, care that, that's given to patients and the improved care uh, with these non-invasive techniques. I have a few questions for you. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, have you seen any patients that are not appropriate to have this procedure and, and what complications uh, can you report after 20 years of uh, experience? Well, thank you for asking uh, very important and very pertinent questions. We've been working together for many decades. And uh, as a vascular and cardiovascular surgeon, you have bailed me out of, of many different uh, scenarios and complications. And I appreciate your friendship and your expertise and your professionalism. Of course, there are many patients that are not candidates for this particular procedure. And I would like to mention some of them. For instance, patients that have a severe calcifications of the access site or common femoral artery would not be good candidates. It doesn't mean that they cannot be uh, used for this particular approach, but they are at higher risk of failure of closure devices. Another a patient that might not be a good candidate, a patient with extensive disease of the access vessels and patient that has uh, very small access vessels, whether femorals or uh, iliacs. 
or patients that had previous extensive surgical procedures and a lot of subcutaneous uh, scarring, and also patients that have uh, uh, vascular conduits, as well as patients that have aneurysms at the access site. But this is a relatively small percentage of patients, and I would say nowadays, in our experience, close to 90% uh, of patients are candidates for the use of closure devices for large bore sheets. Well, thank you, Dr. Crazier. The, the, uh, uh, the history of the last 20 years of developments in endovascular treatment is so impressive, and uh, you're one of the leaders in that field. We, we congratulate you. Uh, we appreciate the audience's uh, attention, and we look forward to the next session uh, at the Texas Heart Institute. Thank you. Thank you.